next on the symposium stage, three essential steps to reaching 10 million in revenue and becoming cash flow positive with Kai Sato, founder of Kaizen Reserve, starting now on the symposium stage. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Has, uh, has anybody actually reached 10 million in revenue as an operator or come across it as an investor? Is this a, we have any entrepreneurs in the room or things like that? You have, sir? One time, multiple times? Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna have to pick on you. And it's, uh, it's always a little bit more fun when I can actually talk to the crowd, I, especially in a, in a group like this. You don't, you don't wanna just kinda feel like you're pontificating and shouting at people. But um, my name's Kai Sato and Actually, Kaizen is my holding company, and, and more recently, I've, I've dived into a, a private equity role. I'm a general partner at a unique private equity shop called Maoloa. Uh, we, we don't do as many micro-cap related things, but we, we invest in a lot of cash flow positive businesses and kind of buy and hold them forever, uh, very similar to how Buffett invests in things like Seize Candy. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but if you guys have questions uh, about a company you might be looking at or one of your companies in particular, um, a lot of these just kind of come down to the fundamentals of building businesses. But as many of you know, less than 1% of companies ever get to that 10 million figure. Less than 10% even get to a million. So if any of your companies have done that or you're looking at them, they tend to be in pretty rare air. But it always kind of comes down to these three phases. And if you reverse engineer any of these companies, this is what you'll find. <clears throat> so it really comes down to go-to-market strategy. And once you find that niche, that beachhead, then you kind of build around that and you make sure you know who your customer is, you accelerate word of mouth. And then ultimately, once you've established the business to a better degree, you are able to go into kind of this whale hunting biz dev mode and do larger strategic partnerships, maybe channel partners and things of that nature. And we'll look at a few examples, but one I wanted to, to throw out, do we have any sports fans in the room? People care about that? What's your, who's your team, sir? Mets and Yankees, okay, great. Um, I grew up in the sports industry, and I'll, I'll share a little bit about my background, but just quickly to share this story. Um, this was actually a startup, and I come from the startup world before uh, I got involved with a, a microcap and, and helped take it public on NASDAQ. But this, this company, um, they were really successful entrepreneurs with a previous exit, but they were deeply passionate about sports. And a venture capitalist friend of mine came to me and said, hey, you know, these guys are kind of running out of dough and they kind of have something, but I think they need to pivot and shift, and any of us who's been in that seat knows what that's like. So I went and met with them, and sharp guys, really good at blocking and tackling, but as always, we sometimes need that outside perspective to uh, help guide us. And so they had a team management software. So it was a piece of software that kind of texts parents who to bring the oranges and stuff like that. And the problem with that is crazy crowded space. There were also already multiple acquisitions. Uh, and then compounding the problem, they had five months of runway left. Uh, when I went into their office, they just started to sublet it and they laid off 60% of their staff. So not dissimilar than a lot of the microcap environment right now, which is kind of why I shared this story. But quickly, we just picked one feature that was working. And we said, hey, we're not gonna do team management, but they would actually enable you to watch your kid play from a really grainy feed when you couldn't be there in person. And they were using a phone or an iPad to do this and they found that parents wanted to do it. Uh, and because I'd built a sports startup that we still own, we realized that that was a really big pain point and a big need. And so we had them put their resources into that and it started to work. And so in, in one summer month, they, they did about 120, 120,000 in revenue. All the things kind of metrics started to jump, used, uh, used that to raise 3 million bucks. Uh, a year later, raised 12, and in the midst of that, a guy named Dwayne Wade, if you know from basketball, started to use it to actually watch his son's eye play, and sent out a tweet to 8 million of his followers and said, this thing, Baller TV, is pretty awesome. I get to watch my son when I can't be there on the road. And so we, we kind of knew we had something, so then it was a matter of kind of going into that expansion mode, making sure that we were on the, in the right sports, moving from basketball into volleyball. Again, the team did a great job of executing, and then uh, ultimately they, they've raised another $40 million round, put the company in the black. And so this is a business that uh, went from life support, much like I think a, a lot of uh, publicly traded companies have, have had to endure recently. And then because they did these things, uh, they were able to shift in focus. And it was the first time I'd left a company as, the, as one of the founders and I was just an advisor to this business, kind of helping coach them through some of that stuff. And I later did it uh, in the microcap space. So just quickly, uh, I always share the first part. I grew up as a caddy, actually. It was, a, it was a big part of my life. And as you get into biz dev mode or learning about how businesses are, or connecting dots for companies, 
Uh, I was super fortunate that I ended up joining uh, Bel Air Country Club where I caddied in college uh, when I was 28, 29 years old and have been there for over a decade. And so golf's a big part of my life, my ecosystem, and you know, my favorite thing to do. But we wrote a business plan when I was at, uh, at college at USC that was LinkedIn for recruiting scouting. So basically helping kids get recruited through the internet in the mid-2000s. And so we saw Facebook that was growing, saw things like LinkedIn. Um, and so we, we wrote the business plan prize, raised a million bucks after winning the business plan prize, set that on fire, raised more money, kind of set that on fire, much like a lot of first-time entrepreneurs, pivoted a little bit and then found our way, all the things that we'll kind of talk about that pertain to all businesses, but especially microcaps right now. Um, once that business was in a pretty good place, I started doing some angel investing, went on a board of a business, um, ultimately got pulled into uh, one that was doing about a quarter of a billion dollars in revenue as the chief marketing and then chief innovation officer, which was acquired by a public business out of Canada. Uh, that was actually in the, the shrimp space. And then started to build more startups. As you can tell, startups uh, certainly have been my, my gig, uh, building aquaculture, seafood startups globally. So in Norway, Ireland, Singapore, uh, and also had an annual board meeting in Kona, Hawaii, which was pretty cool. Um, so we built that up. It's backed by Cargill. There's about 50 companies across three funds. And then I got pulled into the microcap space. And I think like a lot of us, uh, always was always into investing. I forged my mom's signature in high school to create a Scott Trade account. And you know, these days I'm one of the bigger Buffett, Munger nerds you'll ever meet. Um, they've, they've certainly kind of shaped my, my approach to business, but also just my approach to life on a lot of levels. And so a friend of mine had a piece of technology as many of these microcap stories begin, and it had been spun out of HP, and it allowed you to transition your glass between clear and dark. And so he, uh, like a lot of people when they reach out sometimes, was, uh, was in need of funds. And it was promising technology, but like we talked about, go to market maybe was a little bit scattered, certainly didn't know its customers yet, was nowhere near biz dev mode yet. And uh, we were able to bring in a large public REIT as a strategic investor, capitalize the business a little bit, put it out on OTC, then capitalized even more with 20 plus million dollar round and then took it public on NASDAQ. And so what blew my mind, and you guys have probably been at it far longer than the four plus years that I was operating in the microcap space, is that many of these companies are publicly traded startups. And it was, it was this convergence of my worlds of having built a lot of startups uh, as an investor, an advisor, board member, whatever you want to take the role, um, and noticing that microcaps have this huge challenge, which is a very public scoreboard of their stock price at all points in time, right? And so it's so hard for them to ignore and block out the outside world and just focus on building the business because you have a lot of IR commitments or different things like that. Uh, has anybody endured that in his or her microcap career? I would imagine. Um, and so in that process, I'll share a little bit more about the story, but ultimately wrote a book around a lot of these types of things and uh, you know, have somewhat increasingly become a talking head around different things like investing, microcaps, startups, sports, food, uh, and especially private equity related Warren Buffett, Munger stuff. Um, is anyone familiar with this diagram, Crossing the Chasm? Crossing Chasm was a foundational book is written by a guy named Jeffrey Moore, and it really just lays out a lot of these things. So if we look at one of the more famous and oft quoted microcaps of all times uh, is Amazon, right? And how did Amazon start? Like we look at this pantheon of product offerings and AWS doing billions in revenue, they started by selling books to the internet, right? Not the sexiest of theses, but they knew that they needed to prove out that niche. From that niche, you accelerate word of mouth, build that core business, become dominant in that respect, and then only then do you start to branch out and, and do other things and how you sequence those markets really matters. So any business, and you know, another one that gets talked about of course is Netflix, another microcap that grew up as a public company, similar type of deal, right? If you go back, it was sending stuff through the mail, making a big pivot to streaming, making a huge mistake in bifurcating movies and TV shows, they, they, they shifted out of that one pretty quickly. But anything big starts small, and again, People way smarter and, and more established than I have long said this, but Bill Gurley of Benchmark Capital, one of the biggest VCs in the world, just says go to market doesn't get talked about enough. And so you hear it on these earning calls and you, you really feel for a lot of operators and CEOs, they want to be doing the right things, but then they always have this pressure for addressable markets, right? TAM, oh, we've got this vertical and this vertical and we can go after all of them. And they ultimately kind of boil the ocean. But uh, Peter Thiel's probably been the most outspoken of this, not specifically to microcap but certainly applies is just making sure that you 
establish that niche, and then gradually move into markets. And we find, like any company, microcaps are extremely resource constrained. And so they have to be even more disciplined in spite of the fact that every single day, or at least five days a week, their stock price and the market cap is splashed throughout the news. So go to market is absolutely critical. This is one of the biggest areas where we dive in, similar to Bowler TV, was making sure that we pick that one niche, we pick that one lane for them, live streaming basketball games, right? And they became the best in the country at it. And so that was hardware, it was software, it was market penetration, just making sure that you are able to uh, establish a niche from which you can grow. And one of the biggest things, again, just stealing things from people who are way smarter and better. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with this, but Jeff Bezos, one of his biggest strategic moves has always been to write the press release before they create the product. So this is a bit mind numbing for a lot of people if they've never done it, and it sucks. It's a brutal, painstaking process. But you get all the people in the room, the salespeople, the engineers, um, the support folks, even marketing. And instead of building, building, building a product and then just pushing send on a press release, you work backwards, as they call it. And there's actually an entire book written by ex-Amazon executives about this. So once I learned this, found it extremely useful, I don't do anything without it. Uh, so you know, hell, even my wife sometimes has to write press releases with me when we're doing personal stuff. So um, getting everyone together. What it does is forces you to think from the customer's perspective. Get outside your own heads. It's not about these features. It's what, who is the customer and how do we fit into their lives. So you actually write this press release. It's iterative. And then ultimately, you don't leave until you have an actual quote. And so you can actually go back to the early 2000s and you can see Amazon's first press release, and how they wrote it before they ever launched AWS. And so $80 billion top line product, started as a press release, as did Prime. And they're open about the mistakes that they made with this process. They pre failed pretty badly with the phone, but it just gets everyone aligned and it kind of blows your mind the first time you do it. So for anybody who's linking about these things, highly recommend that you look at the Amazon press release exercise working backwards, and that allows you to find that niche. Um, from there, you can actually start to say, oh, well, we're going after you know, women who are 35 to 55 who have master's degrees and love the color purple. And you can say, hey, these are customers. This is how we fit into their lives. A recent one that we've been dealing with because we have a, uh, a Christmas-related business in private equity is Elf on the Shelf, which kind of took over this recent holiday season. And I have a two-and-a-half-year-old at home. So I know that we're not the customer yet because he's not quite old enough to know what's going on. He kind of believes in Santa. He's really pissed at the Grinch right now because we told him he stole our Christmas tree. Once you know who your customer is, then you accelerate that word of mouth. You build around it. So take that press release. And that's where things like social media come in or testimonials or uh, going to events like this and just making sure that you know the fish for which you're, 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 you're targeting. Um, that marketing piece, and I think you've got a guy over here, Phil, who's really started to do a good job at, for this conference. And I told him that right when he'd come on is, you're ultimately accelerating word of mouth. So I don't know about you guys, but the reason why we wear the clothes we wear or watch the shows that we watch, it's because someone credible has told us. Yeah, we can be, uh, you know, befall into advertising. Usually it takes about eight to nine impressions to hit us. But ultimately, if someone says, hey, try this restaurant or, you know, watch this show and we know them and we trust them and we like them, we're compelled to act. So at the end of the day, no matter what you're doing, whether it's acquiring customers, fundraising, how do you think about that bottom of the funnel and how do you accelerate word of mouth? So usually you've got to spend some time on this. Uh, you, know, you know your customer, you're establishing more thought leadership, but you need to make sure that your customers are willing to speak on your behalf. And back to that curve, there are the early adopters who are always wanting to say they were first. Uh, I don't know about you guys, if you ever had one of the first uh, iPods, they were absolutely terrible. Uh, you know, you were scrolling through that thing. It didn't store that many songs, but everyone wanted to be first, or many people wanted to be first. For me, I'm actually a later adopter of technology. I want them to get the kinks worked out. I would never buy the first version of a car, but just kind of knowing who your customer is, how you attack those markets are critical. Back to the, al a the Amazon analogy, they were selling books to the internet, but they were obscure books, right? It wasn't just the book that you could walk down and get from Barnes & Noble. It was something that they could store in a warehouse and then sell to the right types of people. Um, and so this last piece is really, really where I think the microcap community struggles the most. Um, and I, <laughs> I'm a real nerd. I, I listen to the earnings calls. I'm a pretty active investor with my own capital, especially in, in small and kind of mid caps. Um, and you listen to people and they'll, they'll say they have product market fit and you hear them going after these myriad verticals and they have the greatest mousetrap ever. Um, 
But if they try to scale prematurely, if you don't have a niche, if you don't have customers who will actually advocate for you and push on your behalf, you're kind of setting yourselves up for failure. And so, you know, Teal again talks about how distribution is so critical. And if you can get one distribution channel to work, you got a business. But if you try a bunch and none of them work, you're screwed. And so only in hindsight do we oftentimes see this. But uh, it, it happened really recently with a business that uh, I had a close relationship with the, the COO of a now, what, $15 billion company that's it's kind of in the cyber software space. And it was their dream to partner with this company, maybe as a strategic. They, they, they knew that it, it could be a, a tremendous catalyst for their top line and their business overall. But the reality is they were trying to skip steps. They hadn't found their niche. When you talk to their customers, they really didn't know who they were or how they could benefit them. And so I wasn't willing to make the introduction to them. You always want to be helpful. But just knowing that that business could actually implode, it could fail, because yeah, they have some buzz and they have some customers, they have some revenue, they have some impressive investors, but ultimately back to big things start small, you have to have that lane discipline and keep executing niche customers and then you can go onto those bigger targets. And um, I, I touched on what my micro cap experience in particular where I was the co-president and chief marketing officer we, uh, when we started to deviate from this, that's when things, I think, became more of an issue. And, and ultimately, I wasn't comfortable being there as an executive and, and parted ways. But uh, when we started out, we had really great IP. We capitalized the business, uh, had a, a, you know, a very significant NYSE listed REIT as an investor. Um, and that technology, we actually first set out to prove it in skylights. So instead of going into big commercial office buildings and trying to fill the entire, the entire wall, we said, hey, we can actually make these small, right? And it's very similar to, hey, say, how like Tesla started. They didn't build their own cars. They took their technology and they dropped it into the Lotus chassis. So just being smart about how you do it. We, uh, we did raise 21 and a half, went public. So it went from a company that was kind of struggling to now all of a sudden is publicly listed, worth $360 million, um, had some really, really compelling start, uh, strategic partnerships lined up. And we really hammered the customer acquisition marketing. We had a lot of ESG themes, climate themes that were in support of this, and they wanted the technology. The problem is, again, we couldn't build big, right? We hadn't established that niche, and the niche, in my opinion, uh, needed to be the residential skylights because we could build that product. We couldn't quite scale the technology to something larger yet. And so when I felt like our, our go-to-market became undisciplined, uh, we weren't doing what's kind of proper customer discovery Ultimately, I needed to resign just because it, it was the right thing for me to do. Still wish them well, have some friends there. But uh, unfortunately, the stock, like a lot of microcaps, has dropped to an all-time low and, and may become delisted. And so just to, to reiterate, there are these three steps. Uh, you, you really can't try to defy them. It's like trying to defy gravity. And so often with microcaps, they're just always facing this pressure from Wall Street and IR and uh, if you look at the greats, so you look at Amazon, you look at the way that Jeff Bezos approached it, he always had that, quote, day one mentality. And every shareholder letter that he sent out ever since 1997 had the original shareholder letter that focused on long-term thinking, taking care of the customer, which are all of these things just in a more abbreviated form for the microcap community. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Recommendations. What what will happen? There have to be another avenues to somehow verify that people are actually using the product. Yeah. Or they're not, you know, sh shills or whatever. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. It, it depends which what it is, right? Is it a software business or is it people scamming Amazon reviews or some of those types of things? Um, look, ultimately, it, it is. It will blow your mind um, if you're if you're looking at a company or you're running it or you're talking to teams. You say, who's our customer? Who's the niche? And social media, um, having helped build a social network earlier in my career, and, and you know, I use different ones, you have to be mindful of how quickly those can change, right? So my favorite is probably LinkedIn because it has the most staying power, it's the most professional, there's a reason why Microsoft bought it for $26.2 billion. But lately there's been this emergence of TikTok, and who knows what's gonna happen. Uh, but for certain brands, it's the perfect platform, but keep in mind these things are highly fluid, right? I came up in a Facebook era, and then it was mobile and Instagram, and then all of a sudden snap with an ephemeral message, and then they fell out of, out of favor, right? And then, so just always kind of try to stay ahead of it. 
I think AI is gonna make a huge impression on social media because we're already at a place where they can write tweets for you, they can write text out for you. So I think you have to be, you have to monitor it as a consumer or as an investor, but I feel like you can always tell when they're talking about product market fit or being customer centric, I wanna go to their site and see what somebody's saying, uh, right? If, if, and I wanna be able to see that streamlined process. I'll go look at their press and are they working that type of stuff in and looking who the followings are? Yeah, you can, you can buy bots and users and all that type of stuff, but I think any company needs to be mindful of which platforms it's using. And the, the analogy for me is always fishing, right? You gotta know who you're fishing for. So if you're going after a younger demo who's consumer and mobile oriented, sure, TikTok will work for you. But if you're going for one that's older or is, is a little bit more oriented toward commerce in, in different ways, yeah, maybe Facebook or different platforms will, will work for you. Does that answer your question? Thank you, Kai. We're really out of time. Um, if you have any questions for Kai, if you would grab him on the way out, appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely.